Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, today's last virtual LID seminar. Uh, today we have Alexander Olszewski uh, from Boston University. He will be giving a talk today on networks independence and distributed convex optimization. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for uh, giving today's talk. All right, thank you. Um, let me try to share my screen. Um, Okay, so can you, can you see my title slide and can you see my pointer? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Uh, I'm actually, because I'm not teaching this semester, I'm really not in the habit of using Zoom. So um, let me know if, uh, if something goes wrong. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. It's nice to be back at MIT, even if virtually so. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some joint work with my co-authors uh, Yanis Pascalidis at BU, Artin Spiridonov, who's my PhD student, and uh, Shipu, who's at the City University of Hong Kong. Okay, so kind of to very loosely, uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at, at any point. Uh, I want this to be um, a discussion if possible. So feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, pipe in. Um, so kind of to loosely motivate what I wanna talk about, uh, let me start with this figure. I kind of forgot where I got this from, maybe one of the OpenAI blog posts. So on the x-axis here is year. Uh, every data point corresponds to a paper uh, that achieved some kind of benchmark um, on some kind of learning task. And on the y-axis is the log scale of the compute, time that it took to train that model. So what you can see is that there's an exponential increase. So the models in the field are taking longer and longer and longer to train. And this trend is not entirely sustainable. Um, there's only so long that this exponential increase can continue. Of course, Moore's law is in some form continuing with specialized hardware for these problems. But there's also a consensus that at some point you reach uh, diminishing returns. So what I want to ask is, can you use parallelism to try to throw more and more compute at these problems. Uh, in particular, can you use distributed optimization, which is something that many people, uh, especially at LIDS, have been working on for decades, and which was developed in the context of building sensor networks, uh, kind of distributing optimization using some kind of message passing. Could you use that to actually speed up computation for machine learning tasks? So this is, um, tricky question because the sort of situations are different, right? So in the past, uh, many of us have developed this nice theory of distributed optimization, uh, but that, was, that had sensor networks in mind. Whereas in machine learning, usually everything is trained within a single computer cluster. And actually, let me start by talking about how this is done in practice. So if you open up sort of your typical paper which achieves something or other, uh, by training a neural network in parallel, what do they do? Well, in practice, what everybody does, yeah, well, what 90% of the people do is they use a very simple um, server worker architecture. So, you know, there's a centralized server. Uh, if you can see my cursor, I'm just gonna use it to point. There's a whole bunch of workers and they typically iterate in rounds. So there's a bunch of data. The data is distributed among the various workers. And then, you know, they do this iterative procedure where the server says, okay, if they're training a neural network, the server says, here are the current weights. Every worker just says, okay, well, here's my data. Here's what you need to, how you need to perturb my data in order to get slightly better results. They send that back to the server and the server updates. So it goes repeatedly by, um, from server to workers and back. And this is very simple. And if you actually look at the typical number of workers that people use, it's something like five or 10. So today, sort of for practical purposes, everybody does this and it more or less suffices. However, there's also a sort of understanding uh, that this is not going to work if you want things to be, um, oops, uh, if you want things to be large scale. And the reason is that there's a bottleneck at the center, okay? So if you do so, everybody, every time they compute something local, they got to broadcast it to the center in the middle. Um, and the amount of computation, the amount of transmission is actually very large. 
So if you do some back of the envelope calculations, right? So imagine you're training a very large neural network, right? So for example, uh, there's Turing NLG uh, recently released by Microsoft Research that achieves state-of-the-art performance on several benchmark tasks, and that has 17 billion weights. And every weight is a 64-bit number. And imagine now you have, let's say, a thousand nodes rather than five. You very easily get that you need to transmit something like 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 15 bits every single time uh, the servers, uh, the workers communicate with the server is enormous, especially if you want to scale it up potentially to using uh, more than to using um, nodes that are not in the single in the same data center. So there's all sorts of research about how to deal with it. I cite a few representative papers here. Um, but none of the uh, or relatively few of the existing work actually solves the issue conclusively. So for example, people look at things like, can you compress gradients? Uh, and that clearly will save you some factors, right? Um, maybe, okay. So what is our approach? Well, we want to do what is known by distributed optimization, which is that we're gonna consider these kinds of problems, but we're gonna consider them over an arbitrary graph rather than the star graph. And the reason that matters is of course, for an arbitrary graph, we could pick anything, something that doesn't have this big bottleneck, et cetera. Uh, but the question has to be right, okay? So typically in the traditional distributed optimization literature, people are often very happy with something that converges. Here, we're not gonna be happy with something unless it gives us some kind of speed up. And in particular, what we're looking for are results of the form that if you're going to do something in a network of N nodes, then it should be N times faster uh, in some way. So I'm gonna make all this more precise starting with this slide. So, uh, now I'm going to sort of take what I'm saying and make it uh, more formal. So let's discuss the details of our assumptions. So we're going to take a simple thing like gradient descent, and we're going to ask how we can make it work with message passing in a network of processors. And the network is something like here on the right hand side. So not necessarily a bottle has any bottlenecks, uh, which is to say nodes with high degree, just any graph will do. And we're gonna take the simplest possible model. So in the simplest possible model, at each step, nodes can broadcast a message to their neighbors and they can also perform a local computation. Okay, and I'll say a little bit about what these computations are in the next slides. Uh, but so this is sort of the simplest thing you could say. You could also look at more complicated models like nodes can do 10 local updates for every broadcast, but I just wanna stick with the simplest possible thing. And maybe we wanna throw some realistic effects on there. Like for example, maybe links have delays, maybe messages can be lost, uh, maybe nodes could act asynchronously. This is certainly uh, realistic and even, and particularly so if they're not all within data center, for example, messages over the internet are lost. Okay, so that's the network model. What do we want to do? Uh, what we want to do is this. We're going to assume there are n nodes in the network, and the ith node knows a function that we will call fi of theta. And I'm going to assume for simplicity, fi is just going to map r to r. Uh, there's no particular reason to assume that technically, except to make things simple. Uh, there's not a single Kronecker product in this presentation uh, in, because of this assumption. Um, and our goal is to find a minimizer of the average function, which I'm going to start denoting by capital F. So capital F is just the average of these local functions. So node I is the only node that knows the function lowercase fi, but what they want to do collectively as a network is to find the minimizer of capital F, which of course depends on all of the functions. And local computation, when I said in the previous slide, a node will do like a local computation per step. What I meant, typically what that means is it can compute a gradient or subgradient of one of these functions fi. Okay, and this is a simple problem, but it's exactly what you want to solve in the machine learning setup. So typically the high level summary is that what usually happens is that you'll have a bunch of data and you'll distribute that data among various nodes and fi of theta, measures how well the vector with the parameter theta fits the data at node i. And what you want to do is you want to find the parameters that fit the entire network the best. So maybe I'm just going to belabor this a little bit. Um, yeah, so you know you can capture a lot of problems within this framework. 
typically you're going to have training data and training data is going to come in pairs. There's going to be features and there's going to be labels, X, K, Y, K. Your goal is to find a predictor H, uh, which can be for our purposes, anything. Uh, H is parametrized by some theta. Think of like the weights of a neural network. And you want H to basically approximately map every X, K to Y, K. You'll usually do this by introducing a loss function on the Y space. And then if F, I of theta is the loss suffered by theta on the data at node i, so the sum here is taken over script xi in the definition of a phi of theta, if i is the loss suffered by theta on the data at node i, you want to find the theta that minimizes the average of the losses. Okay, so this has a very, um, uh, a very long history. I'm sort of gonna do a little bit of a cop out and say I don't really wanna discuss it at any length because if I did, then I'd be here like the entire 60 minutes of this presentation. I'm just gonna say that in one form or another, this goes back to the 1980s. The precise problem formulation I've just stated dates to the seminal work of Nedich and Ozdeglar. Uh, many thousands of papers have been written this over the next decade. I am going to focus on my main question, which is convergence times, but specifically the question of speed up. Can you use this to actually get speed ups over centralized methods? And if you look at the state of the art in the literature, uh, up to the last two years, the answer is very clearly no, that results actually compare quite poorly to what you get with a centralized method. And they, not just that, but somehow the more nodes in the net distributed optimization is. It's interesting, you expect more nodes, more parallelism to be better. What you get out of existing bounds is often the opposite, more nodes make things worse. And what I wanna talk about is how to fix that. Okay. So I need to start by telling you about sort of the state of the art. So I'm gonna describe uh, sort of the seminal paper by Nedich and Ozdeglar that started this. I'm gonna describe what kind of convergence rates exist for that and what are the problems with them that we're trying to kind of improve, fix, and so forth. So we saw so the starting point is the distributed subgradient method. It's a beautifully simple scheme. So we're in a network of n nodes and the ith node of a network maintains a variable theta i of t and theta i of t is updated with two terms. First, you're gonna take a linear combination, actually a convex combination of your, uh, this is a sum over the set of neighbors of node i. Aijs are gonna be weights of a convex combination. And then you're gonna take minus and you're gonna put some kind of step size times the subgradient of your local function. And you can show, I'm gonna sweep some things under the rug here, I don't want it to get too technical. You can show that it works under some assumptions. It works in the sense that you run this scheme over a network and everyone will converge to the same global minimizer of capital F, right? This is a distributed update everybody node i only uses the gradient or subgradient rather of its own local function but where everyone converges is converges to the minimizer of the global function capital f and sort of um i'm this by the way i realize that many people in the audience probably have seen this a million times but i do want this to be a self-contained presentation so i'm going to be a little i'm gonna uh maybe over explain things a little bit so the key thing here is that the step size on the subgradients should go to zero. And the reason this matters is you can think of this as kind of trying to reconcile two different poles. So the first term, you take a convex combination of your neighbors. So in some sense, you know, or, or in, in the direct sense, it puts you in their convex hull. Think of this as something that pulls you towards your neighbors. And think of this as something that pulls you in a locally good direction. So your subgradient, kind of pulls you towards your minimizer. Not really, it pulls you in the same like general half space, but it sort of pulls you in a direction that locally maybe you want to go to. And somehow this scheme over time reconciles these two things. And because the step size on the subgradients goes to zero, at the end, everybody comes to consensus. And the challenge is to argue that not only does everybody come to consensus, but they come to consensus on the global object. So before going on to the next slide, I need to introduce some notation. So I'm basically going to take these weights and I'm going to stack them up into a matrix, which I'm going to call uh, capital A. Um, and uh, 
capital A here should be a symmetric and stochastic matrix. Sorry, a bit of technical trouble. So capital A here should be a symmetric and stochastic matrix. And you can choose the weights in such a way to make it so, as I'll explain in a little bit. All right, so that's kind of, uh, believe, I mean, this method was proposed actually almost 15 years ago, and it still remains state of the art. Um, and, uh, Let me now describe the convergence rate that this method has and explain kind of what are the, the issues here. So this, is, this theorem is um, completely correct. And part of the problem in having correct theorems on the slide is that there is a lot of technical detail here that I don't want to spend that much time on. So um, let's just say this, that what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the error. And the error is going to be the gap between the function, the global function at the optimal point and the global function at um, some function of the iterates. So typically, when you do an analysis of the subgradient method, you run your method at, uh, you evaluate your method as some kind of running average of the iterates. And we're going to do the same thing here. This actually might require an extra round of average consensus to solve. Okay, let's forget all about that. We have on this side some kind of measure of the error. And on the right-hand side, what we have is we have a sum of two things. And let's examine them individually. Uh, by the way, this result, I should say, is not really new. Arguably, I mean, the reference for it formally is a survey paper I co-authored in Proceedings of the IEEE a couple of years ago. But essentially, it's been there in every single paper anyone has written on the subject, including the very first one. So I, I, I don't claim any novelty for this result. But this is kind of what the standard things lead to. So you have a sum of two things, right? That's how you bound the error. And these two things have an interpretation. So the first term is basically the same as what you would get when you would analyze a centralized subgradient method that can do subgradient steps on capital F. So that in some sense is what you want to benchmark yourself to. You want to benchmark yourself to, to a centralized subgradient method that can access all the gradients in parallel. The second term is something that captures the effect of the network. And what it is, is, okay, both terms decay like one over square root of t under a one over square root of t step, t step size. That's common for the subgradient method. Uh, but what the second term has is it has a numerator over this one over square root of t, which scales like one over one minus lambda, where lambda is the second largest eigenvalue of a. So just to kind of go back a little bit. So we start with a graph. On the graph, we run this distributed optimization scheme. That scheme has weights, Aij. Those weights get stacked up into the matrix A. And this is related to the eigenvalue gap of the matrix A. So I mean, there's quite a few steps here. Um, and this is what you pay for using this decentralized method, right? So if somehow you had magical access to all of the subgradients at a single location, you would just get back the first term. But you get more than that. You get that plus this network dependent term. So the question is, how big is this? I, I used to call this the price of decentralization. And the question that's very natural to ask is, how big is it? And unfortunately, the answer is quite big. OK, so let me now say this more precisely. Um, of course, a little bit, it's a little bit of begging the question because, OK, you have to choose the weights. And then based on your choices of weights, you have this one over one minus lambda. So how big is one over one minus lambda? The answer is, well, it depends on how you choose the weights. So many people, including myself, have written many papers on the topic. And I don't want to go to it. I'm just going to go to the punchline. And um, you can ask me more about this um, uh, after the talk, if you like. But if you want to optimize the worst case performance, the best choice of weights is this. 
it's aij is has to be inversely proportional to the largest of the degrees of inj and this choice of weights basically makes one over one minus lambda as bad as o n squared in the worst case and that's actually achieved by a line graph on n nodes um, it's a little bit better on some other graphs so for example on a 2D grid, it's basically linear. On a complete graph or an erdos schrodinger random graph, it's a constant. So let's think about this. So the price you pay actually increases with n, right? So the more you parallelize, the worse your performance is, um, which is counterintuitive, right? Or at least it's not what you want to happen. The way you want to think about it is that when you do something in a network of n nodes, there's two competing effects. On the one hand, you now have the ability to do n local gradient computations. And so the bigger n is, presumably the more gradients per unit time or subgradients per unit time you can compute. But then the network is sluggish because nodes don't know what the rest of them are doing. They're using some kind of very simple scheme to spread information around. So as a result, that kind of dominates and larger n, in the worst case, make things bad. Um, if you think about how bad it is, it can be quite bad. So let's go back one slide. And uh, remember I said this, this, this is your analysis, our analysis of the distributed subgradient method. And one over one minus lambda is, as I just said now, O n squared. So if you want them to be below epsilon, n squared here gets divided by square root of t. So you really need t to the order of n to the fourth in order for this thing to be small. Um, and this is not just an issue of bounds. There's a very simple simulation. This is sort of my go-to example for um, uh, just like the standard toy example I use for this. So can you compute a median in a network? Why median? Because typically when you analyze the subgradient methods, you assume that the subgradients are bounded. And that comes out very naturally when you're computing the median. So if node i, if you follow my cursor, has number mi, and you want to compute the median of these numbers mi, that's just the sum of the L1 deviations. Um, and of course, every one of these absolute values has subgradients plus one, plus one or minus one. So they are, of course, bounded. I'm going to generate these mi's uniformly in negative 10, 10. And I am going to solve this until uh, you're within 0.1 of the true median. And here I'm going to plot number of times versus time to reach this accuracy 0.1. And the range is kept fixed at negative 10, 10. The numbers mi are random. OK, so unfortunately, um, for already 50 nodes, you need about, um, I guess, 10 million iterations which is, if you think about it, really what you really a lot more than you should have to compute the median of 50 numbers, right? So my point here is that it isn't just an issue of like the bounds you can derive. You can actually come up, you don't have to try very hard to come up with examples where things are slow. Now, I kind of cooked up this example in order to, um, in order to show things are, can be bad. And are overdone, and maybe you can argue that things are not actually as bad as um, this example makes it sound. So, um, what are a couple of things you could do? Okay, you could use a slightly smarter method. So, for example, in 2017, I, I, I published a paper actually much earlier than that, but it was published in 2017 where. I was arguing, okay, you take something like a netted just Douglas scheme, you basically do an extrapolation, but you do an extrapolation only on the consensus part. So if you've seen Nestor of acceleration, this should basically look kind of familiar. You want to do some kind of Nestor of acceleration, but only on the consensus part, not on the other one. So you basically take a gradient step with linear combinations, you take a gradient step without linear combinations, and then you do extrapolation of one versus the other. And there's a standard kind of thing you can do in this situation where you can follow the proof of Nestor of acceleration to take the square root of the rank time. And in this particular case, this allows you to reduce one over one minus lambda over square root of t to square root of one over one minus lambda over square root of t. 
So instead of a worst case of ON squared, you can do a worst case of ON. And then maybe you want to argue, you know what? Um, you're in the real world, things really aren't on line graphs. In the real world, things are maybe on a computer cluster, and a computer cluster is stacked up something like a grid. So if you plug in the corresponding values for the grid, which has better eigenvalues, you can get this to square root of n uh, down from on. Yeah, OK, so you can do all this. Um, it doesn't get rid of the underlying problem, right? The underlying problem is that things get worse with number of nodes rather than better. So you can make things better. You can improve the scaling. You know, square root of n over t. Uh, at this point, t will need to grow with n to make things small. So scalings are much better. But you still don't get the benefit of parallelism. You're just getting worse at a slower rate or at, at yeah. OK. So that's, that, this is the problem. And this is, this is what I want to solve. And to come back to sort of my motivation, all of this is fine if you're motivated by, let's say, sensor networks. And you argue that you know, in a sensor network, everything should be distributed. And this is what you should do. But it's not fine if you want to use this for machine learning applications, in which case you need to have a speed up. If you don't have a speed up, then simply this stuff will not get used. OK, so the main result, um, I'm going to give a number of um, technical statements. Uh, but all of them are going to have exactly the same fra framework. So the idea is that if t is large enough, t is the number of is the, how many iterations you run the algorithm for. If you run the algorithm for long enough, in some, and if you have the right algorithm, in some cases, that second term, that price of decentralization, that thing that depends on 1 over 1 minus lambda, it just disappears. And all you're left with is just the performance of a centralized method that has, access, has the same computational power as the entire network, has the power to query all the gradients in parallel. Uh, and I call this, OK, asymptotic network independence. OK, so let me now make this more precise. I mean, I said this, but uh, words are inherently vague. So let me now kind of give you a theorem. First, I'm going to change the assumptions a little bit. OK, so I'm going to say now the functions fi are not merely convex. They're mu strongly convex, and they have gradients. And I'm going to say that every node can compute a noisy gradient of your local function. So if um, your node i, what you have access to is the gradient. Uh, actually, since all the functions are from r to r, I might as well say derivative. Um, so what you have access to is the derivative of your local function fi at your local estimate theta i plus noise. OK, so your functions are strongly convex, but the gradients are evaluated with noise. And um, the noises are independent uh, across time and across nodes. OK, so you want to ask, OK, so we want to argue that distributed methods are good in this setting. Let's first discuss how well does a centralized method do. So here's a result. I got this from a paper by uh, Shamir and Sridharan a few years ago. Uh, this probably is not. I'm not sure if it's actually the best reference. I think there's another paper by Nemirovsky. But this was certainly the most Googleable, uh, which says that if you take gradient descent um, on this, you plug in your noisy gradients for your gradients, you take a step size of 1 over mu t, then the associated performance scales like this. You look at the expected deviation um, between theta t and the optimal value, the expected square deviation. And that basically square scales like 1 over t, specifically sigma squared over t mu squared. Um, OK. So now let's think about our benchmark, what we want to achieve. So let's think about a centralized method that now has the capacity to compute the gradients of all of our local functions fi instantaneously and just combine them instantaneously. So what it would do is, of course, it would just average them. And once it averages them, the noise gets divided by n. So such a method would basically get the same result, except I will replace sigma squared by sigma squared over n. Makes sense, right? 
you have access to noisy gradients. Every gradient is corrupted by noise. So if you have n uh, noisy gradients, uh, the noise will just get averaged. Your various get, variance gets divided by n. OK, so this is our benchmark. OK, so now this is the first main result. And this is the work of my, uh, my brilliant student, uh, Artin Spiridonov, uh, just recently published. It says that if you take the same Nedichos Daglar scheme, you basically do the natural thing. You take the same step size 1 over mu t that I discussed on the previous slide. Your noisy gradient replaces your gradient. Then your estimate for the distance to the optimal solution squared is a sum of two things. So just like before, the first term is the uh, performance of the corresponding centralized method. So this is just what we had on the previous slide. This is the performance of the centralized method that has access to all n gradients per unit time step and can combine them simultaneously. And the second term is, OK, I'm going to use this notation O n lambda to denote that this thing uh, decays, uh, this thing, uh, OK, the thing within the O notation is a power of t. But the constant could depend on 1 over 1 minus lambda. And implicitly, therefore, it could depend on n. Right, because 1 over 1 minus lambda, we can talk about the worst case overall graphs. So there is some n dependence here, and 1 over 1 minus lambda dependence. But the key point is this k is like t to the 1.5. So asymptotically, the second term is negligible compared to the first one. Uh, in particular, if you wait long enough, the second term is you're just going to be left with this thing. And this thing is the performance of a centralized method. Um, that uh, has access to all of the n gradients simultaneously per unit time step and can just magically use them. So this is a so the punchline here is that you can actually get a factor n speed up with a distributed optimization method in this particular case. The caveat is that you have to wait long enough. And how big is long enough? Okay, well, I'm going to discuss this. Um, uh, in a lot of detail shortly. Uh, and I should say, though, before I move on, that this also works on time-varying graphs, time-varying directed graphs. You could put delays, message logs to make things asynchronous, and so forth. So let me show you kind of how this looks like in practice before discussing it um, in detail. So let's take a simple example where we try to find a separating hyperplane here between the orange points and the blue points. Um, they overlap slightly. So your features here are points in R2. Your labels are plus one or minus one. We're just going to take an SVM. We're going to take a hinge loss that encourages a linear predictor to have the same sign as the label. And we're going to regularize things with a quadratic, which is important for us because our results are strongly convex. We are going to take these nodes and we're going to distribute them among on a network of 50 nodes. Okay, So n is 50 here. So here's the performance. Let's just focus on the figure on the right. So the distributed is the blue. The centralized is, uh, the centralized is the orange. So the distributed is the method that does uh, performs what I just showed you on a circle graph of 50 nodes. Whereas the centralized is the method that can compute in a centralized way 50 gradients per time second. And of course, centralized is better just by definition. But the theorem says that uh, they catch up. So if you look at it at about uh, 8,000 nodes, the curves overlap. The shaded regions here are confidence bands, and you see they start overlapping as well. So sort of the punchline here is that if you're going to do this many iterations, right? if you're going to be at this point on the curve, uh, you can get a 50 times speed up by distributing your data among 50 nodes and doing distributed optimization, right? Um, and it's a fairly, it's not an enormous amount. Um, you can do, here's the same thing with delays, right? So uh, if you look at these graphs, you see that what happens when I add delays? Oh, and I also add link failures um, randomly. 
Uh, I forget what the probability of a link failure is, I think maybe 0.3. It's the same thing, distributed on 50 nodes catches up with centralized method that can compute 50 gradients per second per, per iteration. Um, but it takes a little bit longer. It takes maybe a little bit more than 20,000 nodes. And here's kind of the similar graph if you make it um, asynchronous. Um, uh, yeah. So interestingly here, while the result is the same and the theorem uh, we proved handles all of these cases, uh, the confidence bands really look different in this case, which is um, interesting. Um, okay. I should say this is not the first result with this property. So actually there have been a few papers that have explored this in the past. So I think the very first papers um, I found out recently were from Ali Sayed's group. I list one, but there is a number of others. Uh, he considered things like fixed step sizes. And when you do a fixed step size, when you don't send the step size to zero, as I've shown in the previous slide, you're not gonna converge exactly to the optimal solution. You're gonna look at the neighborhood of it, but then you can look at things like mean squared error. Um, uh, you can look at mean squared error and you can see that in the limit that doesn't depend on the network. So there were a number of theorems along these lines in um, uh, Ali Sayed's work which you can see are very much sort of in the same flavor. Maybe another thing that uh, kind of was a step forward was a nice paper by Shipu and Alfredo Garcia, who gave this kind of differential equation with uh, both uh, attraction and repulsion among nodes. And they showed it satisfied, um, it satisfied uh, a similar property, but that unfortunately did not lead to an algorithm. Maybe the first clear statement in the literature of this kind of property is by this paper on Morale, Bianchi, and Fort on stochastic approximation, where they showed that stochastic approximation in the limit, you will have this convergence of centralized and distributed. Unfortunately, they kind of assumed that the method is bounded. So properly read, perhaps their result is either it grows unbounded or it gets the kind of nice performance that we're describing. And uh, the paper I presented to you, there was a bit of a simultaneous discovery. So another paper by um, Kolokolova, Stich, and Yagi had essentially the same result, though uh, I guess I should say we were on the archive a few months uh, earlier than they were. All right, so I think this is kind of the main point, uh, but as you might guess, I have a lot more to say, right? So. But I think the, the main point, I think, is something I've, uh, if, if you left right now, you, you would probably get it. Now, one of the central concerns is how long does this take, right? We keep saying, for large, I, I say, like, asymptotically, the network goes away for this method. Uh, but if that takes, like, 100 billion years, um, that may not be very attractive. So we, we need some kind of bound on how long it's going to take until a decentralized method is going to catch up with the centralized method. So this is a paper uh, uh, with uh, my colleague Yanis Pascalides and uh, former postdoc uh, Shipu, where we gave an estimate, uh, and actually we gave an estimate that is tight. We showed it's n over 1 minus lambda squared. Um, this is an upper bound, and there is an example that's at least as bad. Um, and actually, this is a good point for me stop for a second and kind of dwell on this network independent property. So you can't get rid of the network entirely, right? You can't have a distributed method that doesn't depend on the network. That just doesn't make sense. Of course, a distributed method has to depend on the network somehow. Um, but the point here is that in previous kind of results, the network entered as something that hurt you for all time and did not allow you to get any benefit from parallelism, no matter how long you ran the method. Here, the network still enters into the picture, it has to, right? But it enters into the picture just as a transient bound, just as something that says that you have to wait this long, and then basically the performance of the decentralized method is the performance of the centralized method with the same computational power times some constant. So the, meth the network just gets moved into the transient, but just, I want to emphasize this since I had conversations about this with a few people and there was some confusion on this. The size of the transient is network dependent. It has to be. 
right? So just imagine, for example, running any algorithm on the line graph, right, of n nodes. It's going to take order of n steps for a message to just go across. So for the first o over o of n steps on the line graph, uh, you're uh, you're not going to be anywhere close to the optimal solution because nodes don't even know, uh, haven't even received a single message from somebody far away in the network. So there has to be some dependence in the network, but that dependence here is solely in terms of transient until you reach performance of centralized mapping. Okay. Now the next question that it made sense to me to ask was, what about the original Nedichos de Glar method? Is that network independent? Um, so let me put it on the slide again. So we're looking at um, this method, which takes convex combinations and subgradient steps. And these assumptions now change back. So the assumptions under which you analyze the subgradient method are, um, you, do, you assume the functions are convex, but that's it. And you assume that the subgradients that enter into the algorithm are bounded. These are kind of the standard set of assumptions to um, analyze this. So no more Lipschitz gradients, no more strong convexity. And you usually analyze this in um, two distinct settings. So the first setting you analyze is uh, you analyze this under a step size that is summable, um, sorry, square summable, but not summable. So you take this alpha and you say that the sum of the alpha has to be infinite, but the sum of the alpha squared has to be finite. And that, you know, it's something like one over T, for example, this constrains how much alpha can decay. The other regime is this is alpha T is one over square root of T. So these, which is actually the optimal decay rate um, for, for this method. Uh, okay, so you wanna ask, well, Okay, so this is the assumption under which you analyze, and we want to ask, is it network independent here? So in a preprint I posted on the archive, the answer was actually quite surprising to me. Uh, one is network independent, two is not. So that's kind of interesting, because in this class of um, square summable but not summable step sizes, you have step size that decay like one over t to the 0 0.50001. That is network independent, but 1 over t to the 0 0.5 is not network independent. Let me illustrate this with a figure. Okay, so let me kind of explain what's going on here. Um, let's look on the left. So here I'm gonna show you uh, what happens when you take a step size of 1 over square root of t. Um, I do this on a particular example. So I constructed a particular counterexample to show the method fails to be network independent. And I'm showing, um, showing the performance on that example. I can tell you more what the example is. It's a particular by simple bipartite graph, but I want to not focus too much on that. There is a particular family of graphs I'm simulating this on. Uh, so on the x-axis is the number of iterations. And on the y-axis, we have to look at this carefully. We look at the error, right? F at, X, at the average iterate minus the optimal F, that's the error, but we multiply the error by square root of T. So if your error decays like 30 over square root of T, this thing should flat line to 30. And we're plotting three different things. We're plotting, let's say, uh, um, I have this family of graphs and I'm plotting it with 10 nodes, I'm plotting it with 110 nodes, and I'm plotting it with 210 nodes. And what you see is that it converges to something like two with 10 nodes. So basically the decay rate is like two over square root of t here. With 110 nodes, it converges to something like 20. So here the decay rate is 20 over square root of t. And with 210 nodes, it converges to something like 40. So the decay rate here is 40 over square root of t. In particular, it's not network independent. You never ever lose the entire uh, effect of the network, right? No matter how long you go, it just continues to persist. And the larger the size of the network, the worse your performance. Okay, now compare that, I'm gonna take a step size of one over t to the three fourths, same method. And when you take a step size of one over t to the three fourths, the error you can expect that to decay like t to the minus fourth. So you're gonna plot t to the one fourth times the error. And in that case, you have this kind of behavior, which is network independent, right? And 
just let's discuss it. You basically have all sorts of things that depend on n initially, but eventually every one of these goes to something that's less than a half. So eventually you satisfy your bound that this is less than the error is less than one half t to the minus one fourth, uh, regardless of n, provided t is large enough. So you can see how these charts really, really behave differently. Like this is not a theoretical artifact. You just do a simulation and the behavior is very, very different. And while this characterizes exactly when the net edge of the Glar scheme is and is not network independent, it's a very unsatisfying answer, right? Because you really want the network independence for the one over square root of t step size, square root of t step size, right? Because that is the optimal rate and you almost get it, but no, right? You, you get one over t to the 0 0.501 but not one over t to the 0 0.5. So I don't think that's a fundamental limit of any sort. I think it just needs a, a different method to get it, um, to get it to decay in a network independent way at this rate. Okay. And uh, last result that I'm gonna present to you. Um, again, all the results I'm gonna tell you have the same flavor, you know, Something is gonna match the performance of the corresponding centralized method if you wait long enough. So, but um, optimiz first order optimization is a bit of a zoo. So under various assumptions, you get various rates and the rates you get depend on these assumptions. So this is one more scenario in which we were able to obtain um, uh, this kind of performance, which is to say when the functions are convex and smooth. So let's consider convex and smooth functions. So um, every fi has m Lipschitz gradient, or I should say m Lipschitz derivative, since I assume they're from r to r. And you want to minimize the global average over a compact set omega of diameter g. Okay, so let's talk first about the benchmark. What do we want to compare ourselves to? Well, imagine a centralized method that can compute every single local gradient at, ev at every time step, and then it'll just average them and do gradient descent. That's what we want to compare ourselves to. So how well will that do? Well, so you're going to do gradient descent on the function capital F, and the standard estimate is it's going to converge as md squared over t. m is the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. Um, d is the uh, Um, the diameter of the convex set of the compact set omega. And of course, T is iteration. Let me check if um, there's, well, okay, I guess I'm not very good at Zoom. So I wanted to see if there's any like comments, but somehow uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay, well, in any ways, um, that is what we want to compare ourselves to. We want a distributed method that matches that somehow. Um, so what do we do? Okay, one observation is that we can't use a, uh, the Nedich Osdaglar kind of method. And there's a, there's a very easy to see reason why this kind of scheme will never work. It's because gradient descent on this class of functions um, needs a step size that's constant. Uh, by contrast, in the Nedich of the Glar scheme, in order for that to work, it needs a step size that is decaying to zero. Uh, because you have these two poles, one of them is the pull you have towards the uh, neighbors, the other is the pull you have in a locally good direction. And everybody needs to converge on the same minimizer. And so in order for that to happen, the pull towards your neighbor has to be a lot stronger than the pull in your locally good direction. So the way this works out in the methods I discussed earlier is that step size goes to zero, right? So again, just think of this maybe as like springs, okay? So think of this as like a spring that connects you somewhere in the direction of your minimizer. Think of these things as springs that pull you towards your neighbors. Well, unless this force goes to zero, you're just going to converge to some equilibrium where not all the nodes have the same values. 
So you got to fix that somehow. Okay, so there was a very nice paper a few years ago by Guanan Ku and Lina, which showed how to make this work with um, with uh, uh, particularly a more sophisticated method. And their error rate was n to the fourth over t in terms of the number of nodes. And there was also dependence there on m and d, but I'm just kind of hiding that in the O notation. But what we really want to do is we want to match this. We want to match md squared over t. We want to match the centralized method with the same computational power as the entire network, and that has no ends in it. Okay. In order to describe the method, um, I'm going to use, I'm going to introduce some notation. So um, I apologize for this, and I suspect actually everyone in more, most people in the audience know what a graphophotion is, but I'm just going to go through this carefully to be self-contained. So given a graph, an undirected graph, I'm going to define the matrix L, where Lij and Lji, I'm going to set it to negative one over the largest of the degrees of Li and Tj whenever I and J are connected. And if I and J are not connected, I'm going to set Lij to Lji to zero. And I'm going to set the diagonal entries of L by requiring that uh, the rows of L add up to zero, which means I have to set a LII to be the sum of these things without the minus sign. OK, um, so this is a particular, this is a Laplacian with a particular choice of weights. And observe that the matrix I minus L, identity minus L, plays the same role earlier as the matrix A. What I minus L does is it takes convex combinations of the entries of the vector X. The reason is because L has row sums zero. So I minus L has row sums of one. And also the diagonal entries of L are less than one. This is immediate from this expression. Um, so the uh, diagonal entries here. So the whole matrix is not negative. Okay, so L is the graph Laplacian. And I minus L times X takes convex combinations of things. Um, I'm going to need one more notation. Uh, and this is the last piece of notation. So just bear with me for one more bullet. Uh, I'm going to introduce Q to be the sum of the local functions Fi of Xi. Uh, so here, kind of the difference is that every function has its own argument. So Q gets applied to X1 to Xn is f1 of x1 plus dot 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 plus f of xn. So when we take the gradient of q, that just stacks up the individual derivatives, right? Because when you differentiate this with respect to x1, only the first function has x1 as the argument. OK, so that brings me to the last result. The last result is this, that there is a method. And um, let's just take it as given for now. It's doing something. And this is a distributed method. So the idea here is that we have three things, g, x, and y. And the ith node is responsible for the ith entry of these, of these vectors. So the ith node controls the ith entry of g, the ith entry of x, and the ith entry of y. And they're doing things. But what are they doing? Well, it's built out of distributed operations. So multiplication by a Laplacian, that's a distributed operation multiplication by i minus Laplacian, also a distributed operation. And then, you know, you have these gradients and the gradients are, um, uh, when you take, as we said, the gradients just stack up the derivatives. So the ith entry here depends only on the derivative of the i function. So this and p's are the projections on the set omega. And we assume the set of omega, they're all optimizing over the set of omega and omega is known to every node. So this is a distributed method. And sort of the punchline is that for large enough t, this matches the performance of what we were just discussing. It's omd squared over t. Uh, you got to do something a little bit weird. You have to take the average of the individual. Um, you have to take a running average of the individual nodes over the last t over two time steps. So it's a, it's a little bit strange uh, to do this. Um, and OK, the punchline is that, yeah, you can do as well with, as with a distributed method on n nodes as a centralized method in this setting that queries all n nodes in parallel. Um, I'm kind of running out of time. So I have a few slides sort of saying 
what this method is trying to do. Um, but uh, maybe I will skip them. Uh, and uh, if, if anyone wants to ask me, I, I can go into details of that in, in Q&A. So I'll say that, that I tried hard to think of something simpler than this, but somehow this was the simplest method I could think of that, um, that does it. So this bit of analysis I can skip, I can come back to it. Uh, I can come back to it um, if someone wants to hear. So kind of the punchline of this presentation is that we can throw n processors at a problem and have the result be n times faster. And we can use this using distributed optimization. I sort of gave this, show this empirically for SVM, uh, but the setting was a general setting of optimization, uh, so rather separable optimization. So you could actually apply it to all sorts of methods. I'm gonna mention two particular nice papers from a group in Facebook, which use this to train neural networks. So they were able to do this, uh, to parallelize this with uh, 32 nodes, and they were able to get linear speed up. Uh, and a couple of things about their results are interesting. So first of all, they're able to get linear speed up with these methods. That matches the theoretical results. They were also able to do this faster than all reduce. Um, if you know what all reduce is, all reduce just kind of fuses the gradient. So you, you just uh, kind of simulate a centralized method that combines the average of the gradient by kind of fusing gradients along various paths and trees. Um, so you're a, they're able to beat that by a factor of three, which actually makes sense, right? Because if you think about a method which does something like takes a spanning tree and fuses gradients along a spanning tree, it will not attain a linear speed up like the methods that I showed you. And um, they were able to do to get uh, as well as the val and they were able to get a validation error uh, for a particular deep network that's as good as you did with any other method, but training's faster. The other thing that's very interesting is that they were able to get this speed up by employing a time varying sequence of directed graphs for the averaging process. That was very key. So I didn't really talk about how to incorporate directed graphs into this. It can be done, uh, but this is one of the things I just want to kind of, uh, uh, it's technical and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it can be done. Um, they could not get the speed up with undirected graphs. Uh, and I think it's an issue of constants. So here I had O notation for everything, but if you want to get things in the real world, you need, and you want to get things faster, you really need to care about the constants as well. Uh, and uh, so you need some kind of maybe more refined analysis uh, to understand what's really happening here. And of course you can apply it to all sorts of other distributed settings. So there's uh, you know, a million people working on various Internet of Things applications that involve various devices, collaborating and so forth. Uh, and potentially you could, uh, you could use these kinds of uh, algorithms and analysis to be able to get uh, fast performance over there. Um, the particular, the thing that I, okay, maybe I'll come back to this in a second. So this is sort of my last slide. You know, I gave you uh, kind of several results that show that under particular sets of assumptions, you can use distributed optimization to really speed up performance of machine learning methods. And there is, you know, a gazillion open questions in this area. I think we're only just sort of scratching the surface. So for example, the transient bounds we have don't seem to match what happens in the real life. In real life, I think transients are much slower, uh, sorry, much faster in the sense that uh, set distributed catches up centralized much quicker. Um, so how do you do that? And there's no reason why you couldn't get one over one minus lambda transient, right? But none of the methods we've uh, discussed seem to have that. As I said, optimization, first order optimization is a maze of different complexities under different assumptions. And it's not clear just how many of those can be like totally redone. Uh, maybe more interestingly, and, uh, and this is partially why I mentioned uh, the results on the previous slide networks, 
you could argue that in machine learning, you don't care about optimization. What you care about is something like generalization. So do you really care about solving problems to optimality? Uh, maybe not. Maybe what you want is you want a method that generalizes well. So the interesting thing is going back one slide, you know, uh, it works in practice in, this, in these particular examples. So this particular group was able to achieve uh, uh, generalization error improvement, fast linear speed up in training without any loss in uh, generalization error uh, using these methods. But I, no one, as far as I know, has any analysis that even um, comes close to proving something like this. So with that note, I guess I will conclude and thank you for your attention. Uh, let me jump in here. Good afternoon, everybody. So thank you, Alex, for a great talk and uh, great fundamental results. So we often say in the beginning of a seminar that our speaker doesn't need any introduction. Maybe in this case, we took it a little too literally. So let me jump in better late than never. So uh, I guess many people already know Alex, but Alex is an eminent Leeds graduate. He graduated uh, it's already 10 years since then. He did an amazing PhD thesis and uh, a paper he wrote based on his thesis got a Siam Review Prize. And after that, uh, well, he collected some more prizes. He spent a postdoc at Princeton, went as a faculty at UIUC, but now we're fortunate to have him nearby at BU. So Alex's style is to always sit back and ask fundamental questions and look at the essence of things. And it's great to see that he's preserving this great Leeds transition. It's also nice to see that one of his co-authors is another Leeds graduate, Yanis Paskalidis, at least in some of the work that he presented today. So thanks, Alex, for keeping the tradition alive and a great talk. Yeah, thank you very much. And if people have some questions, we can go through them or I can ask one. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Uh, let me start with my question and then uh, I guess Francisco can moderate uh, if people raise their hands and ask questions. So it goes back to a discussion we've had several times. So yeah. this study of distributed uh, algorithms, this line of approach makes a lot of sense when you're thrown a graph, uh, you don't necessarily know a lot about it, it's not under your control, maybe the the communication is unreliable. You talked about uh, like mm -hmm. messages and all that, maybe changes with time. But in the machine learning context where you have a lot of control, mm -hmm. I was thinking, I guess you came back to that towards the end, but yeah. uh, you can always arrange your nodes you along can. a log n, a tree of depth log n. And you can- mm, mm, Not log n, because imagine you're stacked up, let's say in a 2D grid. Your tree no, will have diameter. No, I'm talking about the data center. You have your computers, you, you're you running an ML application, you arrange them, which you run the wires whichever way you want. Well, but you want basically to be proportional to the distance between neighboring. I mean, the point is even if they're in a data center, they still have geographical locations and you connect neighboring computers with wires. Oh. Okay, so I guess we can argue about what the diameter will have to be. So let's say whatever the diameter is, yeah. so you form a spanning tree, the depth of the spanning tree is the diameter, and, and you can simulate the centralized algorithm exactly. Uh, Correct, yeah. By, within a factor, multiplicative factor, which is the diameter. Yeah. And you can do that by accumulating partial results along the tree and then broadcasting yeah. that. Correct. So if you take that simple scheme, so then the question is how do you get rid of that D? And it would, could be maybe by thinking through some pipelining tricks or some or extra terms like the way you have done it. Maybe there's a, another line of analysis that gets you such performance when you have everything under your control. Mm. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, yeah. So, but the, na the naive scheme 
where you just use the gradients and send it and it gets sent back, that, does, that doesn't give it to you, right? Because... No, you have to kind of pipeline things. Mm -hmm. Instead of waiting for the gradient to come back, you work, you essentially have a little bit of delay. Maybe you filter, predict whatever the next gradients would be. Okay, yeah, so I, I haven't thought about that. That, that. That's a good point. So there may be other ways to do this. Um, but this way works, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and this way is also wonderfully robust, right? So it tolerates all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so in fact, uh, but I, I agree that, okay, the, the relevant assumption here is that you get to control your graph, but mm -hmm. I think it does have to be subject to some kind of rule about nearest neighbor interactions. So maybe you're there, you're stacked up in a 3D cube, but within that 3D cube, you can rearrange yourself however you want. I think the assumption of a random graph, I, I, I kind of questioned that a little bit because random graph implies every link is kind of long range in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you, you will sacrifice things. Mm -hmm. right? You'll be moving messages, not just among neighbors. Um, in part, this is kind of why I, I mentioned, okay, I don't know, am I still sharing my screen? Uh, I guess I am. Partially why I mentioned these results. So all reduce sort of tries to do this uh, uh, gradient fusing and schemes based on this idea actually beat all reduce, which is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but may you, maybe you can beat all reduce by making it more clever. <laughs> that, that's entirely possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to answer any more questions if anyone has some. If you have a question, feel free to either uh, type in the question or uh, mute yourself or uh, raise your hand. Okay, well. I guess in the absence of more questions, um, well, thank you again. Great stimulating talk and congratulations for the great results. Oh, thank you. My, my, my pleasure to, to be at MIT, uh, even if uh, <laughs> virtually so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Take care.